In this video, we are talking about COVID-19 and the financial and emotional impact that it has had. Welcome to the show. I am Yolanda and it is my goal on this platform to give you easy, actionable tips, content and strategies that you can use to manage your money well and build generational wealth. And if it's the first time that you are watching this video, please hit the like button and the subscribe button and the notification button. Uh, that will allow you to get notified anytime I put out some new content. And it will also help us share this content and hopefully be helpful to others out there. So today on the show, we're speaking to my client. She is one of my financial advisory clients, and she's going to share with us her COVID experience, how it has impacted her life, her health, her household, her family, and her finances. Now, South Africa, we are approaching the third wave. Other parts of the country are in the third wave. Where I am here in Durban, we haven't reached there yet, and we are always the hardest province hit. So it is coming, but the reality is we all need to be vigilant. We cannot afford to relax. We cannot afford to put our guards down. And I hope that my chat with Nisha today will show you what it's like to be a COVID survivor, um, the emotional impact it takes on you and your family, on your finances, and why you should be doing whatever it takes to keep you and yourself and your family safe during uh, the third wave. Discovery has estimated 90,000 lives to be lost due to the third wave or due to COVID just this year. Okay, I do not want you to be part of that statistic. So this is the reason for the conversation with Nisha, Nisha today, to, uh, to hear about her experiences, uh, what she's done, how she's got it. And surprisingly, you'll be surprised to hear how she picked up this virus. And uh, if you do, get it what you can expect. So let's jump into that chat with Nisha Pillay. Today we have, uh, we are speaking to Nisha. Nisha, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. Well, and you? And you're going to share your story with us today on your COVID experience. Yes, I am. I am. I'm a bit anxious, but I am going to. Yeah. <laughs> okay, before you start with that, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, some family history, so folks get to know a little bit more about you. Um, I live in Phoenix. I have a seven-year-old son. I'm married. Um, I work for a company um, that deals with a whole lot of stuff. Okay. I'm an accountant there. So yeah, I have a very stressful job as a mom role. I have a very stressful life there. I'm running around with my son and everything. So yeah. So with, with a young child, I'm sure when the COVID thing came on, that must have really scared you. It was. It was very scary and it's still very scary. My biggest fear, my biggest fear in life was always losing my parents. Now my biggest fear in life is leaving my son on earth without me. Without so. a mom. Yeah, that must be that must be scary. So COVID, I mean, um, you got it in the second wave here in Durban, and it was very scary. It was, I think we were the hardest hit in South Africa. Yes. Um what, what happened? How, how did you think you did you get it? Um, so I definitely got it from my husband. Uh -huh. who, um, he, he went um, shopping on the 31st of uh, December, which was New Year's Eve. He yeah. um, was here in Amshlanga and he went to pick up some food. And when he came home, the first thing that he said to me was, there was so much of people out there not wearing their masks. And, yeah. you know, that was surprising, but we didn't think any of it, anything of it. And we went through um, life as normal, okay. taking the precautions and stuff like that. And then on the 2nd of January, the night of the 2nd of January, I had shivers the whole night. So I was hot, cold, hot, cold. And then the next morning I woke up and I thought, no, maybe I'm getting the flu. So I sent him to Discam to get all our vitamins and flu techs. And that's how I went through the week. I went through the week um, thinking I had sinus and um, I spent the whole week with my parents, with my son, making breakfast. And then on, by the Thursday, I just got worse and I decided to do a test and I was tested positive and my husband was tested positive. Okay, so both of you went for a test together? Yes. Okay. And um, thank God for my parents all tested negative. My son tested negative yeah. and everyone at my husband's work tested ne negative. So that was right. a good thing. 
And um, the first few days of being uh, with COVID, I was like, what is everyone stressing about? Because I was fine. <laughs> I was normal and I was okay. This is okay. I honestly said to myself and my husband, you know what? This is okay. There's no issues here. Why is everyone stressing? And by the sixth day, I, I just had lunch. And within half an hour, I couldn't breathe. Wow. And I thought I was going to die. And my uh, blood pressure rose to 190. Wow. And I, was, I just was struggling. I was struggling to breathe. Anyway, he got an ambulance. And um, um, can I tell you which ambulance was it? Or... Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So we call, we phoned um, KZ and VIP and they were there within 10 minutes. And it was actually two ambulances that pitched up yeah. within two minutes. And their staff was so good. They were trying to um, bring my, uh, they put me on their machines and they were testing my oxygen levels and stuff like that. And I think because my pressure was so high, I was, I was, I wasn't, I was struggling, struggling to breathe and stuff like that. So they were calling, phoning around for hospitals and everyone was full. Yeah, it was the peak of everyone the situation. Wanted, nobody wanted to take me, yeah. This was around mid Uh It was on the 5th or 6th of Jan. Okay. Yeah. Um, so eventually we got, we, uh, it was the Tungat Hospital that um, said to these guys, you know what, bring her here. And I tell you, Yolanda, the trip from my home from Phoenix to Tungat was the worst. I was so afraid that I was going to die in that ambulance. Wow. So it was that bad in terms of being able to breathe. Yeah. And, yeah it was just, and when I got to the hospital and they stabilized me, and I tell you, the staff was so good. They were so good. They were absolutely good. Tongat Hospital, hospital is a private hospital. It's a private, yeah. Okay. Right now, I can't even remember the name, but yeah, they were absolutely good. The doctors were good. The nurses were good. They kept going out to my husband, who was also infected, but he had to stay in the car, and they were giving him updates. So basically, they they kept me there till um, I was uh, stabilized. Obviously, there was no beds, and I went back home. Okay, so you I were in the hospital for the day because they didn't have space. Yeah, for a couple of hours, yeah. Okay, okay. A couple of hours, yeah. Now you are on really medical bad. aid. And that, I am on medical aid. And that really didn't matter because there were no beds. Yeah, there was no beds. That, yeah, that's okay. scary. And I'm on key care. So mm -hmm. key care only allows you to go to live hospitals. Like that's what we know. Key care only allows you, key care plus allows you discovery to, yeah. key, uh, to live hospitals. So anyway, um, got home and then I just decided to sleep. And about half past 12 that night, I jumped out of bed and I said to my husband, I can't breathe. So we went onto my balcony and we sat on the floor and we, we sat there till four o'clock in the morning doing breathing exercises, struggling to breathe, but trying to calm yourself down and going through all these exercises and just taking in air. And that's what we did till four o'clock in the morning and at four in the morning it was I, I didn't know whether I was going to make it for the rest of the day so I called my boss and I said to him although I have capsule legacy my will with them yeah. I, I struggled to sign that will for the last two years because I didn't know who I wanted to put as my executor and who I wanted my child who want you know things that I just struggled to find the person and that will has been lying on my desk for the last two years unsigned. Yeah. And I called my boss just to read over that will so I could sign it. And he did read over it. And he actually got his attorney to do my will, the, do exactly, and made me sign it. Yeah. Um, by 11 o'clock that day, I had um, then contacted a friend of mine who is a nurse at Gateway Hospital. And she told me, you know what, come to the hospital. And she got me a bed there. Okay. So... I got into a hospital and um, obviously now I was okay because I was at the hospital and yeah. I knew that I needed the oxygen. It was there for me and stuff like that. So I stayed in a hospital for uh, I think five or six days, but that was just the toughest thing ever because you didn't know that if you've fallen off like sleep, whether you'd wake up the next day. 
Shucks, that, that it was just a horrible feeling. It was a horrible feeling. And in with the symptoms I had was basically a heavy chest. I had um, diarrhea for 10 days straight. So base, I was like Not on the oxygen and then I needed to go to the toilet and then I'm off the oxygen, going to the toilet back again. That's how life was at that time. Um, in that time, I'd lost, in the space of five or six days, I lost eight kilos. Wow. Eight kilos. I had no muscle in my body. I was extremely weak. And you just you just become anxious and down, and you don't know whether you're going to live the next day. And the worst thing that someone can do during COVID is to be on social media. Because at that time, everything that you were seeing on social media was rest yeah. in peace, rest in and that just puts more anxiety onto you that's yeah. just more anxiety and uh, yeah so okay so you're in hospital for about eight days or so right yes okay yes. and eventually you got well enough to leave I did I left and then I got home and it was actually a Thursday that I, a Wednesday afternoon or a Thursday that I got home and um obviously with a whole lot of medication and I was still struggling with the diarrhea. I couldn't eat anything. And then on Friday, I'd become um, uh, too weak. I was dehydrated because mm. I wasn't taking any in and I had diarrhea. So I went back to hospital, to the emergency room at Gateway. Yes. And um, the nurses put me in one of the rooms and they put me on a um, um, drip and the nurse had to leave because they had more patients. So they put me in this big room. They locked the door because only the nurse could come in and out. No one else could come in and out. And they put me in the trip. And this is a funny story now. Um, through all that I've been through in COVID and almost dying, she just left me and I needed to pee. <laughs> I needed to go to the toilet. Yeah. Just to pee. And, she did, and I couldn't get hold of her. So I saw a red button that says emergency and I pressed it. Okay. Don't ever press that emergency button because the whole hospital, the sirens just was okay. all over oh, the place. <laughs> Most likely you, it was it a fire or was it a medical code, a medical emergency button that you pressed? I think it was, I'm not sure. I think it was a medical <laughs> emergency, I'm not sure. Yes, but no? uh, oh, I had yeah. people coming down on me. Every, I had like about 10 people rush into the room to find out what's the emergency. And I'm like, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> oh, the doctor was furious. Yeah, the doctor. Yes. Yeah, I just tried the entire to respond. It's, it's quite a mission <laughs> just to pay. Okay. All right. <laughs> so... <laughs> So that was the, one of the funny things, but I mean, just the whole experience of COVID, you, you know what, you don't know whether you're going to see the next morning. Mm. And the best advice I can give to people is just stay off social media. Um, try and concentrate on your breathing um, and just fight it. Think about your family and just don't give up hope and don't be anxious. Yeah. Tell us about your physical recovery. How how was that? Uh, that was bad because um, COVID just didn't end at fourteen days for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it went on. I could because I was admitted in the hospital, so I had to take another ten days to isolate. Yeah. And um, after that, I it was you you'd get up in the morning. You are exhausted immediately. By 10, 11, you can't go through the day. You, you don't have the energy. Um, I still had a, a nasal drip. So basically with me, I was having thick balls of phlegm going through the back of my, from the nose into my throat. And that used to choke me. Yeah. Um, I was on steroids, prednisone. So that put up my, I've never been diabetic or high blood pressure. Yeah. Um, I've now, my pressure has been constantly high from that time that I've been diagnosed with COVID. Um, it, it, it just, it, you, I've lost my hair. My hair is falling off in bunches. 
uh, what, what else can I say? It's just, you don't, you don't become normal again. You don't become I, normal. I remember I, catching and you were telling me about the memory loss that you struggled with. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you literally have memory loss. Uh, I was cutting my fingernails and I took the nail clip, clipper and I put it into the fridge and I couldn't remember that. I couldn't remember that. You do the most silliest things. Um, you're talking to someone and you, you can't remember exactly what you spoke like I tell my son something and then he said, but mom, you just told me and you know, you don't remember you, but that's, that's is okay that, now. It's, it's kind is, of, is that the and then the other thing, or, or, or what do you think caused that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that your eyesight, at, when you first come off COVID, you, you battle with your eyesight, like things that you could see before you, it's now blurry. So there was blurry vision. I didn't drive as much because I was too scared that I'd knock into someone. Uh, at the, I started exercising again in March. Um, I started swimming and then I started to run about uh, last year, last month, I started running back five kilometers a day. And I found that when I was running, I was struggling to breathe. And um, just two weeks ago, while running, my heartbeat went up to 209. Oh, shucks. Uh, yeah, so I know you were an activity tracker, so that must have put you on an alert. Yeah, yeah. So I'm now um, uh, seeing a cardiologist. We just, um, I saw him on Friday and I had a heart rate monitor the whole week. So we just checking whether COVID has had an impact on my heart as an after effect. Yeah. So sometime this week, I'll be going in for an MRI, MRI scan. Okay. So prior to COVID, I was very healthy. I exercised, I ate healthy. I had no issues, no um, medical issues, anything of that sort. And yeah, come COVID, I've just got all these issues. <laughs> yeah, and uh, nobody knows the long-term effects of this disease, how it's going to affect us. So it's like we're the guinea pigs, you know, to, to see what happens. Yes, so. that's what I say to everyone. We are guinea pigs in this whole situation. Even our doctors don't know what works, what don't work. But um, yeah, so even at that time when I was in hospital, it was so hard being there because remember the nurses didn't get their vaccines. So they, um, um, the contact with you was very limited because they were scared for themselves mm -hmm. getting, remember they got families as well. Yes. So hopefully now with um, the yeah. nurses and the doctors being vaccinated, they, you know, they understand more, they can go to a patient, find out, you know, what are your symptoms, you know, things like that. Whereas when we, I had COVID, I was left in that room and only when I pressed the buzzer, when I had a symptom or like I was struggling, um, struggling did they come to me? Okay. So maybe now with them being vaccinated, they'll feel much safer and yeah, I think other parts of the country have went into the third wave already. Uh, I guess we will yeah. for our turn in, in, in KZN. So it's up to us to be vigilant. Uh, are, you, are you afraid of maybe contracting the virus again? I am. I'm very afraid. I'm actually very anxious. I stopped looking, looking at the, uh, the, the stats every day because um, I'm so scared of getting it again. I am so scared. And I honestly, if I do get it again, I don't think that I would make it through the second time around. You mean uh, if, emotionally if, or health-wise? Emotionally and health-wise. If, if I experience, I think um, because it hit me so bad, obviously it's affected. You, people just know if you survive COVID, you don't go and test yourself now. You you don't know what parts of your body it's affected. Yeah. So, All right. So, the scary so, so this disease, it's affected you and your family, uh, your son, your husband, your parents, emotionally. Yeah, it's, I'm sure it's taken yeah. its toll uh, in those weeks uh, earlier on this year. What has the financial impact of this disease been on you and your household? Um, as I said to you, okay, I was lucky I was a medical aid, but medical aid doesn't pay a lot of bills. So if you go into... Um, the emergency room, they don't pay that. They don't pay for your medication. So there was a lot of medication I had to buy. Um, I had to invest in a, um, a blood sugar machine, a high pressure machine, high blood pressure machine, um, all the vitamins. 
then it's the doctor's fees that was not paid. There's lab fees that were not paid as well yeah. that I had to pay for. And, you know, um, during this time, you know, it's, your, your cost obviously goes up because now you're trying every medication and everything's like two, 300, 400 and all these. Um, yeah. And don't forget that when this whole second wave started, everybody was going to get ivermectin. <laughs> yes. So we, yeah. we it, with my husband and I, we actually paid 500 rand a tablet. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, so this, that was like you took that before, or during, or after your COVID experience. Um, when I was on the third, second, third day. Okay. The third day. Yeah. And, with the and it was consent. On, sorry. With the doctor's consent, you've been using ivermectin. Well, you know what? Um, yes, I did consult my doctor, but if you want me to take this out, I can take it out. <laughs> no, 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 no. People need to know. Um, my doctor wasn't, um, I won't say she, she, she just said, you know what, I think you should take it, but yeah. it's left to you. Because everybody, nobody knew whether ivermectin was going to work. And let me tell you something. It was on the second day when I was, when I took my second ivermectin, it's that day that I got sick. Okay. So number one, we don't know whether we took the right ivermectin because there's so much of things going on, so much of things being said. There was one that there's an ivermectin for, a, uh, for humans and there's an ivermectin for animals. So which one did we take? Did we take the right strengths? Yeah. We just take it because people said, take this thing, you know, anything to stay alive. Yeah, yeah. Anything. So they, I was put into a cost there as well. And um it's sad that people um, used COVID and made money out of people. You know what? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then it was after that, um, after we, uh, when this ivermectin thing became too famous, we then purchased a card of 10 tablets for 500 rand. Okay. <laughs> As opposed to purchasing five, four five, tablets. Yeah. For 2,000. Shucks. Yeah. Wow. So that obviously has taken a hit on you financially. And yeah. luckily, in your case, I'm your financial advisor and uh, <laughs> we have uh, stuff in place for you for this. So when I, I remember when you first told me that you had COVID, the first thing I was thinking about was a claim because I know what you yeah. had and you actually were two companies, you were Discovery, uh, you were FMI, and I've tried with both. And you didn't meet the criteria on Discovery in terms of any disability or any critical care, because although you're in hospital, you weren't uh, ventilated, you weren't in the critical care part of the yeah. hospital. So you didn't meet the criteria yeah. for discovery and discovery has that 30 day waiting period and you weren't off work or anything like that for 30 days or any yeah. permanency. So we couldn't claim for you on discovery, but you had the FMI portion and, uh, if people want to know more about FMI, they can hit that link there. But uh, with FMI, you had um, temporary income protection. And that's the thing that yes. we were able to claim for you on. Uh, tell us tell us about that. How was your experience with your claim with FMI? Um, you know what? When I, when I signed, started filling out those papers, and it was quite a lot of papers, and... Um, I was like, really? This is COVID. It's yeah. it's everybody knows about this disease. Why are you asking me these silly questions? But <clears throat> I filled it out. It was a bit long, but I filled it out. And um, it was my experience with you and FMI was just great. It was great. You you kept me in the loop all the time. There was no issues. And I think within two weeks I was paid. Paid. Yeah. I, so yeah. we managed, uh, you were away from work in your total experience. How long were you away from work? Yes. Uh, I think um, from Jan, because I was on leave. So for, I was supposed to go back in Jan, but so the Jan, the whole month of Jan, the whole month of Feb, and I went back in the second week of March. Okay. So that was about eight weeks or so that you were away from work. Yes. Due to COVID. Yes. So in your case, we were able to get you six weeks worth of salary. 
on yes. your temporary income protection because of how the disease affected you. Uh, in your policy, you have a 30 day waiting period, which means we could only make a claim for you on the 31st day. However, with, uh, with FMI, we do have lower waiting periods as well. Like for, for salaried employees, it can be 14 day uh, business owners. It can be seven day. So if your waiting time was lower, we could have gotten you more money and you know, that would have helped you mm. out. But how did that payout uh, help you in terms of all of the bills that you have to see to that's outside the cost? You know, once I came out of hospital, I was bombarded with calls from the hospital, from the lab, and then they were threatening to, to um, <laughs> send me to their lawyers. Yeah. So it's, and I know I put pressure on you because I kept saying to you, you know what, I'm being bombarded with these calls. As soon as the money came through, I just paid off everyone that I needed to pay. Okay. And that really helped me. And the best part, there was leftover money from that. And I'd, um, I took my son on a holiday for his <laughs> birthday. <laughs> because I felt that, you know what? I, yeah, I you had almost... After that experience, I mean, sure. Yeah. That must have been so scary. But we're happy to see so this, uh, the back end of the, the second wave. And so glad that you recovered. Uh, this was the first time I had to be involved in, in a COVID claim, luckily. But I'm glad you had everything in place. And I'm sure yeah. when you were taking all these covers, the last thing was on your mind is, you know, at claim stage or anything, you always think about at least my family will be taken care of if I've passed. Yes. But yeah. luckily we yeah. had all of this in place for you. And that's my biggest concern. And I think that everybody who doesn't have a will, will whether you like it or not, whether that it's a sensitive topic, no, you've got to go get your will in place. You yeah. have to have, especially if you have little kids, yeah. You need to nominate that person that if you and your husband are not no longer around, that that person is going to be their guide, guardian then, you know? Yeah, and, and we did see with COVID with a husband and wife getting diagnosed and a child losing both parents within a matter of days. So sometimes exactly. you're thinking like, okay, I don't need a will, my husband or my wife, they'll see to the kids. <laughs> what if you guys died in a matter of both. days? It's because life is different. We're at a different stage of life now. This virus is just killing everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're young, you're old. If it's going to get you, if it, you're going to go. So, and I'm thankful to God that I'm here to tell you my story and tell people out there, get your wills, get your policies in place. You know, make sure that if anything happens, your children are covered. The no. children are covered. All right. So any last thoughts for the people watching and listening to us today? Uh, just stay safe, stay safe and follow those lockdown rules, stay at home, try and go out, try not to go out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and now that we that we on the third wave, we've actually decided to do our own lockdown at home. So we are not going out as much as we used to. Yeah. Yeah, no, we've done the same. Actually, last week was the last, the last that my <laughs> that my helper had come in. So we've gone back to hard lockdown in our home. Uh, we haven't yeah. seen the inside of the mall <laughs> since last year, March. Uh, if we sure. go out, you know, if we go to the beach, we're on, we far away from everybody. It's always yes. outdoors, but uh, yeah, no malls, no shops, nothing. If we go out to get some sunshine at, at a quiet spot on the beach and, and, and that's it. I think and everybody, because yeah. Discovery is, is, has estimated 19,000 lives to be lost due to COVID by December 31st. Sure. Yeah, so it's basically up to us at this point to do what's that to survive. All right, Nisha, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. And I'm, a, I'm very grateful to have you in my life, honestly. I'm very grateful. You helped me a lot. And I, you know, you've always been checking up on me. I've, my previous financial advisors were not as diligent and always checking up on me and stuff like that. So I'm grateful to have you. Thank you so much. No problem. Most welcome. But uh, hopefully uh, next time we chat, it's uh, proactive chatting. We're not doing any claims and we're going to see through this uh, the third wave and third we'll wave. chat later on. Yeah. Okay, Nisha, thank you for your time. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. So that's my chat with Nisha. She really shared a lot 
on the emotional side and the financial side as well. I, I really hope that you're prepared. And, and whether COVID has affected you or you know you're doing the right things, you self-isolating, you put your whole household on lockdown, have a will in place, okay? We're not going to live forever. We just don't know when, we just don't know where, and we just don't know how. So you need to be prepared at any time that this could happen. Have a will in place, especially if you're a parent um, with, with young kids. You need to have a will. And maybe you're thinking you, you don't have much to leave while you need a will. But remember, you have kids. you got to appoint a guardian. Um, you got to, if you have a pension or provident or even a, some small life cover, uh, your kids can't be beneficiaries of that. All right. Uh, watch this video here and you'll understand why kids can't be beneficiaries of um, any assets in South Africa, minors specifically. So you need to have that will in place and to do that estate planning uh, to plan for them and how your assets will be part, uh, passed on to them. Second, I want you to review your current risk policy. And I know traditionally people will have life cover. Uh, if you're savvy, maybe you have life cover, disability cover, and risk cover. And you, you're so with Nisha. I have done Nisha's claim on one of her policies that she had a traditional life, traditional critical illness, traditional disability cover, but I was not able to make a claim for her because she didn't meet the criteria. And that fourth leg you need in your risk cover is temporary income protection. Temporary income protection protects your salary from any medical emergency. If a doctor says that you can't work for whatever reason, you need to be compensated because you won't get paid. If you don't work, you don't get paid. If you don't get paid, how will your family survive? So temporary income protection protects against those uh, minor ailments on that impacts you temporarily. Whereas traditional disability covers you for permanent disabilities, whether it's a partial or it's a full on disability, you'd be covered. So I want you to look at your risk portfolio. If you don't have an advisor to help you, click the link below and I will assist you with a complimentary risk review to ensure that you comprehensively covered for anything that may come your way in terms of um, uh, medical or, or, or death related where you can make a claim. The next thing I want you to do is constantly be reviewing your policy. Your life circumstances change as time goes by. Like now we're in a pandemic and your cover needs to meet your need. So make sure that you have everything in place. All right, so that's it for this episode. I will chat to you next week.